This is the Georgia Farm Monitor. Since 1966, your source for state and national agribusiness news and features for farmers and consumers about Georgia's number one industry, agriculture. The Georgia Farm Monitor is produced by the state's largest general farm organization, the Georgia Farm Bureau. Now, here are your hosts, Ray D'Alessio and Kenny Bergamy. Well, here we go again. Another 30 minutes with us talking about the great industry of agriculture. Hi, everybody. So glad you could join us for another edition of the Georgia Farm Monitor. Still going strong, by the way, after 50 years. I'm Ray D'Alessio. Yes, 50 years and counting and keeping with tradition. We've got another great show for you. Coming up, TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Both presidential candidates are against it, but we'll hear from an American Farm Bureau expert on why it's crucial to agriculture and what you, the producer, can do to help get the ball rolling before the election. Also on the program, he may have one of the busiest jobs in the entire state of Georgia. Straight ahead, the Monitor sits down with the new Georgia National Fairgrounds Ag and Youth Livestock Director, Philip Gentry. The many hats he wears and why he feels he was the perfect man for the job. And then later, proudly celebrating 28 years and number one in the world. See why this farrier school in North Georgia is in a class by itself. These stories and so much more starting right now on the Georgia Farm Monitor. And we begin in Tipton, Georgia, where recently members of various state commodity groups got together for the Georgia Farm Bureau's annual commodity conference. It's a chance for farmers from across the state to talk about the challenges their individual farms are facing and to get an update on the industry and the latest research. The kickoff to the Georgia Farm Bureau policy development process got underway at the 37th Annual State Commodity Conference. GFB First Vice President Robert Fountain told us the process always makes Farm Bureau a strong grassroots organization. But it's an opportunity to come together for, for all of the groups from, from the uh, different parts of the state that are on each committee to come together and hear the same thing because now they're going to turn around and they're going to talk about how this relates to the policy development process, which is so important to the Farm Bureau. Dr. Joe West, assistant dean of the UGA Tipton campus, said he's proud the university has a chance to welcome producers that represent the state's number one industry in 20 different areas. Georgia Farm Bureau obviously has a commitment to agriculture, that goes without saying, but with 20 different commodity groups, that, that signifies to us that those 20 commodities are, are very important. Uh, as a land grant, it's our mission to support research, so new information to make agriculture stronger and better, uh, extension so we can get that out to the users, many of whom were represented there in that uh, commodity meeting this morning, uh, and then to teach the next generation. A number of speakers addressed the attendees this year, including AFBF's Executive Director of Public Policy, Dale Moore. We have 16 registered lobbyists in Washington, D.C., but when you add up the federal lobbyists who are registered in each of the state farm bureaus, you know, we've got 70, 75 registered lobbyists across the country, not to mention the presidents of those state farm bureaus, not to mention the boards uh, and all the grass top leaders, the grassroots members. So, you know, when you, when you can bring a few million members to bear on an issue, it tends to get attention in Washington. And while I enjoy getting compliments for what we have accomplished, nothing happens without our grassroots members weighing in and letting rep their representative, letting their senators know this is what I told my folks in Washington to be working on, and you better be paying attention. As we mentioned last week on the program, this year's Commodity Award went to former State Senator Ross Tolleson. And following the award ceremonies, each commodity group met to talk about the importance of educating the general public about what agriculture is doing across the state of Georgia. Farm Bureau, that's not to say we don't have disagreements. We do. And it, it, they're healthy disagreements because many times in our discussions at, at the policy level, we interject a lot of other ideas into the mix that ultimately lead to a policy that is a, a combination of, of some of the thoughts and ideas in the process, but it tends to produce a more effective end result, and that's what we are trying to accomplish. Meantime, as part of this year's Commodity Conference, the Dean of UGA's College of Agricultural and Environmental Sciences, Dr. Sam Pardue, had a chance to visit a diverse farming operation in Berrien County. Tim McMillan and family got an opportunity to show the dean how important farming is in that part of the state and how important UGA is to all of Georgia agriculture. The Monitor's Mark Wildman has that report. As part of Georgia Farm Bureau's Commodity Conference, Dean of UGA's College of Ag and Environmental Sciences, Dr. Sam Pardue, got to see firsthand how diverse South Georgia agriculture is 
as he toured Southern Grace Farms in Berrien County. We're seventh generation farmers and uh, we're a diversified farm. We uh, grow your traditional row crops, cotton and peanuts, but we also grow fruit, a you pick and a we pick operation. And uh, we've got all about, it, about every kind of fruit you can think of we have here. And uh, we also uh, own and operate a peanut buying point. Tim and his brother Steve are passionate about farming and are eager to share their message with the dean and let him know how UGA helps farmers and consumers all over Georgia. I think we need to educate the public as much as possible. And uh, I'm really excited that the dean is coming because that shows he has an interest in in agriculture in, the, in South Georgia and, and uh, it's good to be able to show him a diversified uh, farm. And I would like to think that I'm just a typical farmer in South Georgia. Dr. Pardue is new to his position in Athens and is eager to talk to as many farmers as possible. And this tour gave him a great opportunity to see many different crops in a short amount of time. It really benefits me to get out of Athens, to be real honest with you, to understand a, a lot more about how the challenges that, uh, that Georgia farmers have to uh, you know, just talk about the issues that they're facing, whether it's from immigration or water policy, uh, markets. You know, we, we can't do a lot about the markets, but certainly uh, it's, it's an opportunity for us to, to learn more about what their needs are and to utilize the opportunity we've got uh, at the university to, to hopefully address those where we can. Georgia Farm Bureau President Gerald Long was on the tour and was able to share information from his years farming. Georgia Farm Bureau works closely with UGA to help ensure Georgia agriculture stays strong. It's a great day to have him with us. You know, him coming from North Carolina, being our new dean, uh, I think it's very important that uh, this organization uh, takes the lead and brings him out onto the farm to see the, uh, first of all, I guess, is the diversity of the, of the farms in Georgia. Uh, and also to have a better understanding of, of what we do, why we do. But I think most important is, is to show him the importance of research and education and the extension service and the service that they provide to us as farmers. That research has kept Georgia's ag economy growing and a big part of the future of our food supply depends on making sure farmers have the best technologies and the best information available. It's really our lifeline. It's, it's who we go to when we have problems. It's the guidelines that I use in my farming operation from the seed that I pick out all the way to harvest. And I, I use extension extensively. And uh, the research that goes along with extension is also very important. Uh, we've got to have the research to be able to continue to improve yields and to be able to feed the world. Not only did the dean get to see crops in the field, but he also got to visit the farm store, which sells many different products, including fresh peanut ice cream. Reporting from Berrien County, I'm Mark Wildman for the Georgia Farm Monitor. In other ag news, with the presidential race heating up, much concern in the ag sector that both candidates oppose the Trans-Pacific Partnership, also known as TPP. That's why American Farm Bureau is urging farmers and ranchers to make their voice heard now. With Congress in recess and lawmakers talking with voters within their respective districts, Farm Bureau says this is a critical time to remind legislators about the importance of the Trans-Pacific Partnership. AFBF trade specialist David Salmonson says farmers and ranchers need to tell their lawmakers the benefits of approving the trade agreement quickly. You know, the Japan is expected to take this up in September and we'll move ahead. Malaysia's already worked on it. Several of the other countries are working ahead. So we're right in there on a good time frame with the other countries. But if we don't move ahead and they do, we'll fall behind on this effort. The world of trade goes on. People will need goods, so we'll be disadvantaged. So it's not only an economic issue for us, but of course there's the broader issues in the entire Asia-Pacific region whereby these countries look to the United States for leadership. And if we're not providing it, they'll look elsewhere. That's why we need to keep at it and hopefully get a vote on this and get this taken care of after the election. Still to come on the monitor, we'll dive into the world of farrier science and show you why this North Georgia horseshoeing school is considered the only one of its kind in the world. But first, meet the man now in charge of the agriculture and youth livestock programs at the Georgia National Fairgrounds why he feels he's perfect for the job and what he hopes to accomplish in the future. Stay tuned. Hi, 
I'm Sadie Lackey and I'm from Gilmer County. I don't come from a strong agriculture background. Um, I was never raised on a farm, so I've never had that experience or that background. In seventh grade, my ag teacher pulled me aside and said, I see great potential in you for public speaking. And I thought she was crazy. I was the shyest person in her class by far. And she got me to do um, creed speaking. And from there, I memorized that creed. I began to understand what the creed meant and how I can relate to it. And my passion from agriculture grew from that and I just become more and more involved in the FFA. The FFA to me is like an open door. There's so many opportunities you can have through the FFA. It's not just set in stone that you have to be focused in on raising an animal or um, having a supervised agriculture project in um, production agriculture. You can do so many things from leadership, um, creativity can just flow through the FFA. There's so many different opportunities and it's just an op open door for anyone to walk through. To learn more about the National FFA organization, log on to ffa.org. My name is Matt Rush. I'm a motivational speaker trainer and as I like to say, most importantly, a farm boy. So I grew up in the great state of New Mexico on a farm and a ranch, cattle operation, and then started speaking and training uh, years ago and now I'm a full-time speaker and a trainer. I heard a motivational speaker when I was in the eighth grade and I knew from that point in time that I wanted to do that. So I'll tell everybody I've got the greatest job in the world. I get paid to run off with my mouth so I can go home and play with my cows. I mean, how can you get any better than this? So, and the reason I really got into motivational speaking and training is because I see the impact, I saw the impact that it had on me, that that speaker had on me. I wanted to be able to have that same impact on somebody else's life. When you're dealing with agricultural groups, there's so many times that people just think, you know what, I'm just a farmer, I'm just a rancher. And at the same time, you have such an ability, you have such an amazing story that you could actually get out there and tell. And I want to inspire people to get out there and tell their story. And you know what, the, the, the importance of the young farmers and ranchers is so outstanding because people will listen to people when they're young. These guys, these guys and gals really probably don't even know the full impact they can have with their voice. When a congressional leader, when a, when a news reporter, when someone in, in a big city hears a young person talking about why they do what they do, but more importantly, why it matters to that person, there's great power in that voice. There's great ability. Uh, three of the uh, three points that I, that I make with my speech is you have to be viable, you have to be valuable, and you have to be visible. And, and viable meaning willing and able to grow, which when you're talking about young farmers and ranchers, I mean, and people in agriculture in general, that describes who we are. Valuable, I mean, look at what we do. What we do in agriculture affects every person on the planet on a daily basis. Thirdly, being visible, getting out there and telling your story. But like I said, it's about telling your story, but why what we do matters to the consumer and how, how it impacts them. If I could be anywhere in the world, it would just be at the farm, it'd just be on the ranch. That's, that's my happy spot, that's, that's my sweet spot, that's where I'm grounded. But I also know my gift, I also know my blessing of being able to stand in front of an audience and deliver a message, and a message that I hope will empower other people to be proud of who they are, to be proud of that heritage that we share in agriculture. With everything from auctions to youth competitions, the Georgia National Fairgrounds plays host to a variety of different events within the livestock industry. Recently, Damon Jones sat down with the man responsible for putting all these events together, the newly appointed Agriculture Youth Livestock Director, Philip Gentry. Each and every year, thousands of cows, goats, and sheep make their way through the gates of the Georgia National Fairgrounds in Perry. That means when longtime Director of Agriculture and Youth Livestock James Floyd retired, finding the right replacement was essential. As it turns out, they didn't have to look very far. Uh, I grew up here in Perry, Georgia uh, on a family farm. My, uh, my dad, his brothers, and, and, and my grandpa were involved in the poultry and row crop and cattle industry. Uh, I went to, uh, to Perry High School, uh, Perry Middle and Perry Elementary. After graduating from the University of Georgia, Gentry spent nearly a decade as an ag teacher at the very same high school he attended. And while he did love that job, having a chance to make an even bigger impact on the industry was just too much for him to pass up. I grew up showing and, and attending the fairs and going to the ag center and showing, and it just seemed like a great place to work. Uh, the people were just awesome. And uh, as an ag teacher, I grew my passion for showing livestock and doing youth livestock projects, and I felt like 
I'd have a, a greater opportunity to influence the, our junior shows and the livestock industry here in the state by working at the fairgrounds. So it should come as no surprise that Dentry is really looking forward to planning and coordinating the variety of youth livestock shows. Uh, we are really very proud of the youth events that we have go on there at the Ag Center because uh, it highlights the, the best that we can be by, uh, by giving the youth of the state a, an awesome facility and an awesome place to, uh, to have events. It's clean it's, uh, and it's first class. It's a fact he takes great pride in as he knows this is a unique experience for both the kids and the parents as well. Like a lot of uh, the youth that come to our shows, they have a lot of money invested and a lot of time invested in the cattle, sheep, goats, uh, swine, and horses that they exhibit. And the adults do too. So we want them to leave with a lasting memory of the Ag Center that uh, their project, their exhibition, their show, uh, their conference uh, was the best that it could be and that old memory uh, that'll last a lifetime. While he might have only been on the job for a month, Gentry does have some big ideas as he hopes to build even more facilities in order to improve existing shows while also opening the door for more events down the road. Uh, we're looking at expansion opportunities. We want to uh, we want to be able, we love the shows we have and we want to be able to expand and help those shows grow uh, in their numbers and grow in their scope and we also want to be able to provide other opportunities uh, for other groups to come in the Ag Center where we may not have the facility uh, enough to host them so we can host uh, multiple events at the same time. And when he's not at the fairgrounds you're likely to find Gentry on the family farm where he helps tend to more than 110 head of cattle. It's a labor of love that provides both a rewarding and bonding experience. Uh, I love to work and I love to work with my hands and I love producing something. And so uh, having this land and having this farm and the cattle that we get to work with, uh, we, we get to add to, to our nation. We get to add to our community by producing beef and producing products uh, that people want. And uh, I also love it because uh, we do it as a family business and it gives us a, uh, something to do as a family together. Reporting from Perry, I'm Damon Jones for the Georgia Farm Monitor. Just a reminder, if you missed any part of Damon's story or others on today's program, you can still see them in their entirety at our YouTube channel. That's the Georgia Farm Monitor. Once there, browse the archive of stories dating as far back as 2009. And once you're done watching all those informative stories, keep clicking like the Georgia Farm Monitor Facebook page we have set up for you. Also, if you have a story idea or if you just want to leave us a comment or suggestion, Feel free, send us a message either on Facebook or at the address you see there on your screen. That is news at farm-monitor.com. Up next on the monitor. I've had students from everywhere in the world. I've had at least one person from every single country in the world. The result of being the number one farrier training facility in the world. And it's located right here in North Georgia. That story when we come back. Where did summer go? The school year is here again. Kids back in class, teachers helping them learn. But many of the items children need to be successful in school come from here, the farm. So when you think about it, agriculture really does send your child to school. Uh, if it's the paper that they use, the pencils that they use, the food that they eat, the clothing that they wear, all of that is thanks to agriculture. Lisa Stearns with the UT Institute of Agriculture is one of the people behind Magic Moments, an awareness campaign for Tennessee farming. Tennessee Magic Moments is to point out agriculture's indelible footprint on our daily lives. And certainly there's a tie-in with ag and education. School life is just full of magic moments. And those, in our opinion, are ag moments. And so we really do like that connection to school. Consider, too, the impact of forestry in the classroom. Trees are used to produce pencils and paper and books, but also the flooring and the desk and furniture. From cotton, we get those new jeans and sweaters, but then there may be the most surprising item of all. From just one acre of soybeans, you get 82,000 crayons. Crayons, yes, they are made with soybeans, actually it's soybean oil. Um, it makes it non-toxic. Gina Thompson with the Tennessee Soybean Promotions Board points out soybeans are used for biodiesel to fuel school buses. The crop also, of course, is used in cooking. Vegetable oil is used mainly in cooking just about everything these days, and the vegetable oil is actually soybean oil. 
And that brings us to the most important thing agriculture produces for school children, healthy foods. Food is essential to the growth of a child. Food is essential to their brain health. And so providing a great breakfast and then of course a great lunch is extremely important. And we see our role in agriculture as really providing that safe, healthy food for children. One of the most important things we do as a society is educate our future generations. To do well in the classroom, children need to be healthy and they need materials. And as agriculture provides, students learn. This is Charles Denny reporting. Finally today, like humans, footwear or hoofwear is critical to ensure good health and proper alignment in horses. And that's where farriers come into play. Yeah, it's believed farriers date as far back as ancient times. And although they haven't been around that long, Casey and Sons Farrier School in Walker County is the only horseshoeing school in the entire state of Georgia. And as I found out recently, students come from thousands of miles away to learn a skill that can lead to endless opportunities. Metal grinding, hammers banging, and the smell of hot iron cooling. For a farrier, these are the sights and sounds of the trade. A trade many feel is a dying art. Yeah, I came from a small farm town, so we always were on horses and we always were around animals and stuff like that. So I spent some time in the Army and wanted to get back to those kind of roots, so this is the best way to do it, was come here and horses. At least I get a trade out of it and get to work with the animals that I like to work with. I've had students from everywhere in the world. I've had at least one person from every single country in the world. Jamaica, Australia, Germany, Ireland, Scotland, every country you can name. I had one guy from Japan. That was the only guy I had from Japan. Established in 1989, Casey and Son offers both a six and 12 week program with the objective of teaching its students the proper shoeing of both a normal horse as well as the problematic horse. Everything from cold shoeing to hot shoeing and even corrective shoeing. Thermal imaging is also a part of the curriculum, which shows the effects of shoeing from the inside out. As Link Casey explains, the facility isn't your average classroom. Along with the Casey and Son Horseshoeing School here, we have the Farriers National Research Center, which is the only farrier research center in the world. So it's located here in Bill now, Georgia. So now it's not equine science, it's farrier science, which farrier science is, is the, the research of the lower limb of the horse. We don't do anything veterinary work, you know, as far as pregnancy or floating teeth, anything like that. Um, but with the research, what where started the research was when Dad started the school in 89 and 90, a lot of the, his students were asking him questions that he didn't have the answer for. So that's what got him to do in the research on what this shoe does, what that shoe does and uh, throughout the years and the concept of shoeing horses has evolved in the last 30, 40 years. Putting a shoe on a horse hadn't changed for the last thousand years, but knowing what the shoe does, what this horse needs this particular shoe, that horse needs this particular shoe, what lameness is and so on and so forth has really evolved in the last 30 or 40 years from the research that's been done here. Now as far as opportunities, once a student leaves Casey and Son, the sky's the limit really. According to the American Horse Council, the economic impact of the horse industry is close to $40 billion annually, which translates to the demand for good farriers. And with hard work and dedication, a good farrier can easily earn a six-figure income. Oh, it would be nice, yes. You know, it's just something you got to work towards, you know. Uh, I'll be here for the 12-week course, and then I'll stay for the advanced course and get a little bit longer uh, experience since I'm a little bit later in the game starting this. Farrier work is one of the last free trades that you could really think of nowadays. Um, there's no license to be a farrier, which is great. There shouldn't, ha shouldn't have to be a license to be a farrier. You can travel to any state in the country, you can travel to any country in the world, and you can shoe horses. And there's all different levels of farrier work. There's backyard horses, uh, and then there's million dollar horses, and there's all different levels of farriers. You have farriers that work with the backyard horses, and then you have your, your top notch million dollar farriers that work on race horses and hunter jumpers and dressage horses, reining horses, so on and so forth. But it's, it, it is not all uncommon to make six figures a year. And it should be noted, they also offer a two-week school, and you can actually stay right there on the property during your training. For more information, log on to the web address you see there. That is georgiahorseshoeingschool.com. 
And that's going to do it for this week's edition of the Georgia Farm Monitor. Well, just a reminder for all the latest ag info regarding food, great recipes, and what's happening down on the farm, be sure and check out our Twitter, Facebook, and Pinterest pages. You'll stay informed and see what's up in the world of farming and the Farm Monitor Show. Take care, everybody. We will see you next week right here on the Georgia Farm Monitor. Have a great week.